Yeah, okay. So we'll start off, I'll just uh, briefly introduce um, the panel and then we'll go through in the order that's alphabetical by last name. So Tim, you'll be up first. Yep, sounds good. Okay. Please give the first slide, right? Sorry, Takashi. Uh, will the opening slide, I can see the opening slide. The Yeah, uh, when it's your turn, I'll stop sharing in a minute and then okay. you should be able to use share on yours. Okay, thank you. Okay. So Mark, I think we're all set here, whenever you're ready. Uh, please, please begin, thank you. Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, everybody. I'm not sure where you all are in time zones, but Welcome to uh, the panel titled Autonomous Roving on the Moon, Mars, and Beyond. Um, uh, in contrast to the, the prior discussion, this one's going to focus more specifically on, on rovers. Um, obviously, rovers have been used to do a lot of planetary exploration to date, uh, especially on Mars with the whole series of rovers um, that the NASA and JPL have, have deployed there over, over the past couple of decades here. And today, we're going to have a discussion uh, with, uh, with several people, a very illustrious group of people. I'm very thrilled to, to introduce you to you all. Um, we have Tim Barfoot from the University of Toronto, uh, Takashi Kubota from uh, JAXA, and Issa Nestas from JPL. And if you haven't figured it out yet, uh, I'm Terry Fong, I'm, I'm from NASA Ames. Uh, what I thought we'd do today is we'll start off by having each of the panelists uh, uh, give a, a five minute introduction, short talk about uh, themselves and the work that they do and then we're gonna go in through a discussion. And uh, the, the panel has prepared a number of questions to discuss with, but of course, we'll also be very happy to take questions from uh, the audience. And uh, I believe you can make use of the sli.do link there that you see there. That's the, the same that's been used for all the, the Coast Bar workshops. Um, and it also appears that you might be able to make comments uh, on Zoom itself. And we'll try to look at both as well. But at this point, let's go ahead and, and introduce and, and welcome everybody. So we'll start off with you, Tim. Uh, I'll stop sharing and let's see if you can then share. Can you guys see that and hear me? Yep, looks great. Okay, great. This is a really exciting workshop to join. Uh, my name is Tim Bark from the University of Toronto, as Terry said. Um, I guess I've been working on autonomy for these types of robots that you're seeing on the screen, uh, not just for space, but also other terrestrial applications of field robotics, um, mining actually, not on the slide, military robots, planetary rovers, and more recently unmanned aerial vehicles and self-driving cars. Uh, so we've been developing essentially core building blocks within autonomy, localization, mapping, planning control, uh, for a, a number of years now. I came to work on these problems through rovers. So these are some historical videos that, uh, that I had fun digging up over the last couple of days uh, from the archives. These are some robots that we deployed in various planetary analog sites over the last 15 years or so. Uh, top left, Devon Island. A number of people have been up there to use that as a Mars analog. Uh, the other two top videos are at the Canadian Space Agency's Mars emulation terrain in Montreal. And the bottom video is actually just at a, a mining quarry that we used as a proxy for a, some kind of a lunar crater. Uh, and we actually came to, to get interested in this uh, visual route following problem. And we developed a, a technique called visual teach and repeat, which you can kind of think of as like an extension to the visual geometry pipeline that's, that's used uh, by actually all of the Mars rovers to estimate their motion from cameras. Uh, we take it one step further to not only estimate our motion, but build a map of a route that we're following such that we can then use that map to drive around on that route as much as we like. So you're seeing some videos here of robots that are repeating routes that they've previously been demonstrated uh, fully autonomously just using stereo vision, so no GPS. Um, and so we, we had the thought that this could be useful for different uh, space applications, including just returning a rover to its lander if it, if it got too far away, 
perhaps uh, on the moon transporting um, goods between a landing site and a lunar base, or perhaps even just used as an emergency return function for a human piloted lunar rover. So actually the middle video is a, a prototype lunar rover that was built by the Canadian Space Agency. So we thought, you know, if something happens to one of the astronauts, you could hit a emergency return button and it could just follow back using this technique. It turned out though that this visual route following had a lot more interest in some terrestrial applications. And it wasn't just uh, something that was beneficial for space. And we found that other applications like security monitoring, mining, um, uh, also benefit from the ability to sort of demonstrate a route using a human and then be able to follow it again. So we've actually developed this out into a full autonomy stack now, this visual teach and repeat framework. And you're actually seeing now a robot that's driving around not just on one path, but an entire network of five kilometers of paths in a abandoned mine quarry. And the nice thing about this technique, if I just sort of zoom forward to the really fun part of this video, is that because of the strong prior of having been demonstrated this route previously, we can drive fully autonomously on it, even through very rough terrain, almost up to the capability of the, the mechanical part of the, the rover, which, which tends to be still a bit of a challenge for some autonomy methods. So we can see driving down steep, loose terrain in a fully autonomous mode. And again, this is just using one camera, one laptop, no GPS, um, no global map even actually. So it's a fairly lightweight autonomy framework that can be used to drive around. So we've been exploring this uh, quite a bit over the years. One of the challenges, maybe not so much for space, but is really relevant uh, on Earth, is that if you're using cameras to drive around, of course, appearance can change due to lighting and weather. And so a lot of our work over the last five to 10 years has actually been around just trying to build out methods that are robust enough to be able to handle, for example, all of these different visual experiences that you're seeing here. This is actually part of an experiment that we did for three months where we drove uh, with a 100% autonomy rate around this small loop despite the massive visual appearance change. And then the other aspect of what we've done that's, I guess, relevant to rovers is we spent a little bit of time thinking about how to access steeper terrain. I think many of us could agree that a lot of the interesting science uh, for planetary applications in particular, but maybe also for terrestrial applications, lies sort of in this steep terrain where the exposed stratigraphy sort of gives you a bit of a geological history. And if you can get in there and, and read that history, you can learn a lot about the place that you're at. So we've been playing around with a, a couple of different rovers. This is one that we built, uh, I guess, inspired by a lot of the work at JPL that ESA's group has done uh, on the Axel robot. This was our take on Axel uh, with an electromechanical tether. So we thought we could build a robot that we could drive down steep cliffs and, and build 3D models. And I guess the fun part about this video is if I zoom forward to the mapping results here, uh, it can show you the kinds of maps that we were able to build with this robot. This is actually a map built with a survey grade LIDAR just at a stationary location that we built as a baseline comparison. And then the next part of the video is gonna show the map that we built uh, with this, this robot. So we descended it down different parts of this cliff and then stitched together all of these different maps uh, into one overall map. And the thought process was that uh, if you could do that, you could actually build quite a large map of, of a crater wall or something like that but we think there are also applications, even uh, terrestrial applications of this. And then I guess the reason I show this video is that the way we built this map was we were actually human piloting the robot up and down the cliff in order to gather the data, which we then stitched together after the fact. So a big question I think for me that, that maybe we can spend some time thinking about in this panel is, how can we start to bring more autonomy to this steep terrain robotics? I think ESA's group's been doing a lot on this. I think it's not a solved problem. He may, he may debate me on that later in the panel, but uh, being able to drive fully autonomously up and down steep cliffs uh, is pretty challenging. And so one thing that we've been thinking about is actually combining the two things I've shown you. So we've got these tethered robots that are driving around, but we also have this visual route following. And of course, if you sort of drive down a cliff and your tether wraps around a number of anchor points, being able to sort of exactly follow your path back up the cliff uh, is a beneficial thing. And so we've been exploring combining these two different things. And then my last slide is just, uh, this is kind of what I spend my day job on. I don't do so much on rovers uh, right now. Uh, perhaps opportunities will come back around in the future, but we've been spending a lot of time on just 
visual navigation for self-driving. And in particular, because we're in Canada, uh, we have uh, snow. And so these are just two videos of almost the same place, uh, just one month apart, December and just two days ago, in fact, uh, with a blizzard and a snowstorm. And so the challenge comes like, how do we start to navigate despite this pretty massive visual appearance change? Uh, so those are the kinds of things that I like to spend my time on. I'll just leave it there. Great, thanks, Tim. Can you uh, stop sharing? Great. Let's see if this uh, works here. All right, so everybody, uh, um, as I said, this is uh, Terry. Um, I actually have several jobs at NASA, which is, is always a challenge. Uh, I am the uh, um, <clears throat> I am the lead of the the autonomous systems. Uh, um, advisory group for NASA, and we spend a lot of our time thinking about autonomy for all different parts of NASA. But uh, um, the job that I started off with is really uh, working in robotics at, at NASA Ames, and uh, I was the, the the lead of the robotics for a number of years, and I'm, I'm currently the chief roboticist at NASA Ames. We've spent a lot of time um, studying a more advanced autonomy than we've than we've been yet been able to fly, but uh, studying these. Uh, these kinds of autonomous systems in uh, planetary analog environments. So we've done a fair amount of field testing in places like uh, the Canadian Arctic, uh, just like, like Tim. Uh, on the top left there is the K-10 rover um, on Devon Island. It's uh, obviously up in the, the high Canadian Arctic. We've done uh, work with the K-10 looking at uh, site surveys and carrying a variety of instruments. We've done work also um, over the past few years uh, down in places like the Atacama Desert in Chile. On the right side there's the K-Rex rover um, and we've used that to take a look at uh, how we can use rovers to carry out uh, astrobiology focused work. And then we have other things which don't look quite like uh, rovers. Uh, in the middle there is a, a dynamic tensegrity system called Super Ballbot. Um, it's really trying to explore a completely different physical architecture for you know, how you could actually explore planetary surfaces. But um, the thing that I spend uh, most of my time on right now, and let's see if this is actually working. Can you all see this slide here showing Viper? Yes, great. So um, what I'm currently working on is uh, uh, what will be NASA's uh, next lunar or next planetary rover mission uh, after Mars 2020 in, in just, uh, just a couple of weeks here. We expect um, that Viper is uh, a planetary rover that will go to the moon uh, in late 2023, um, explore permanently shadowed areas uh, in one of the lunar polar environments, most likely uh, in the, the, the high latitude southern region. Uh, so, so towards the South Pole, but not exactly at the South Pole. Um, and it's a really interesting, uh, challenging mission for a number of reasons. Uh, first off, the lunar polar environment uh, is a very dynamic place here. We have uh, dynamic shadows, uh, shadows that can move as, as rapidly as, as perhaps a centimeter per second. Um, and that's really due to the fact that we are at you know, extreme high latitudes here and the illumination from the sun is, is very shallow. Uh, a second part is this mission is really emphasizing high operational cadence. That is, uh, it's not focused on going to specific sites like the Mars uh, missions have done, but rather going over a specific path. So really traverse progress um, is very important for this mission and therefore the highest priority metric for us is, is something that, we're, that is termed speed made good or the average rate of progress across a traverse path. Uh, it's also quite different in that it's more interactive uh, and significantly interactive I should say versus say Mars rover operations here because it is a lunar uh, mission. We're looking at on the order of about 10 seconds round trip time delay uh, between mission control and the rover, and therefore it's a hybrid of human exploration and Mars rover operations and the way we think about how to control and interact with a planetary rover. Um, Viper is also going to be a really different kind of mission, um, a different kind of planetary rover in that, number one, it has hybrid uh, avionics. It's a combination of rad hard and, and rad tolerant computing on board. The second is the flight software is split um, between onboard and ground systems. So in contrast uh, to the Mars rovers, we, we have the ability because of the relatively short uh, time delay in communications and the relatively high bandwidth we have in a continuous way to send uh, data from the rover down to the ground for processing. So for example, all of the, uh, the stereo vision that we are gonna be doing with Viper is done on the ground, not on board. Um, and as a result of that, we are able to, to make use of um, at least a little bit more a bit of modern software, at least uh, coming out of the research world in terms of the use of the robot operating system or, or ROS. We're actually using ROS version two as part of our ground software system here. Um, let me play a video for you. I don't know if the sound's gonna come through. Um, if it does, uh, you'll be entertained. Otherwise you have to listen to me. <laughs> uh, let's see if this works here. Oops. 
Tim, do you hear sound? It's too faint to make it out. You'll have to narrate. In any case, stay tuned. Uh, we, we hope that uh, um, just about three years from now, you'll be seeing lots of pictures and uh, data coming back from the moon from Viper. But uh, let me stop here and then turn it over to Takashi to tell you about the work that he does uh, at JAXA. Thank you, Teddy. I will share. Okay, thank you very much. So the, I'm Takashi Kubota uh, working at the JAXA. Uh, I would like to talk about the AI and the space robotics activities at the JAXA uh, very, very uh, briefly. <laughs> yes, uh, first of all, I would like to talk about the autonomy in Hayasat 2 uh, mission. The ground based operation is limited uh, to the communication delay. In the case of uh, Hayasat 2 mission, the uh, time delay is about uh, 32 minutes uh, for round trip and the low bit rate from 8 kbps to uh, 32 kbps. The information on sampling region, the detailed terrain and the uh, condition of the surface are not known in advance. That's why the Hypsat 2 missions, uh, so the, where the visual landmark based navigation is uh, developed to navigate the spacecraft to the touchdown area like this. And then, so another technology is the automatic sampling mechani mechanics uh, is developed to shoot a small bright to the surface to correct ejected uh, fragments uh, like this. So the bread was shooted at the 30 km, km per second, so very fast, sorry, 30, 300 meter per second, and then to correct sample like this. So uh, next I will show you the uh, touch down and go, touch and go uh, scheme based on AI technology by animation. So the, uh, the spacecraft descent to the surface by LIDAR, green dot line, and the radar range finder for beam red uh, lines. Then the spacecraft will track the visual target marker, uh, which was dropped in advance. Uh, then the spacecraft will be navigated and the attitude was controlled for a uh, touchdown surface. This is a visual target marker. The spacecraft performed the cancellation of the relative horizontal velocity and also uh, so pinpoint touchdown. Because the region for a touchdown is very, very uh, narrow, small. Then the spacecraft to touch down the surface. So the, well, the, the 
the formation of the uh, sampler horn will be detected by another uh, later rangefinder, then a small bread will be shot to the surface and destroy the surface. The fragment will be ejected to be captured. The spacecraft will lift off soon to avoid the fall down under the microgravity environment. This is the uh, sequence or scheme for a touchdown. So the second touchdown was uh, conducted in July 2019. Uh, so uh, you can see the appearance of the, at the moment of a touchdown and the, uh, ejected fragment like this. So as you know, the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft uh, succeeded in returning back to the Earth with a lot of small, small uh, samples like this. So this is the trajectory of the, the entry capsule. So next I talk about the asteroid exploration rover Minerva. Hypsa 2 spacecraft took a small twin rover to the uh, Ryugu asteroid. And then the, this rover has uh, some functions. New hopping mobility because of low gravity, adaptation with AI and a small light weight. The weight is about the 1.1 kilograms, the low power consumption, and the autonomous behavior, and the scientific observation. So you can see the uh, animation uh, at the, about the altitude of 50 meters. Twin robots will be deployed like this. And then twin robots will bend and bend and stay on the surface because of the low gravity, and then rover will start uh, hopping and hopping like this. So the, the rover was deployed in 2018, and you can see a lot of uh, obtained image like this. So the rover can get the, some video on the surface like this. So next, I talk about the AI and robotics technology for uh, another space missions. JAXA is planning direct exploration missions on lunar or planetary surface for insight to observation and scientific investigation, and also uh, future planetary utilization. So AI and the robotics technology makes important roles in deep space exploration. Uh, so the SRAM technology is also uh, under study like this. So finally, I show you the JAXA's overall scenario for international space exploration. Uh, SLIM is a, a small lander uh, investigation uh, demonstration is under uh, development. Uh, so this, the purpose of this mission is to develop the pinpoint landing on the moon, and then the, the polar exploration on the moon or others, and then the JAXA is also uh, developing the uh, man, so the man, Mars, moon expression like this. Anyway, the AI and the robotics technology is important for promoting uh, deep space missions. Okay, thank you very much. That's all. Great, thank you, Takashi. And then last but not least, uh, Isa, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Jay. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Are you able to see my slides? Yes, that's good. Okay, let me go through. Okay, great. Uh, well, it's great to be here. And um, I'm going to touch upon uh, autonomy and mobility uh, for space applications. Um, so the work I've been doing, I've, I'm a roboticist at the Jet Propulsion Lab, and I've been working in the field for a couple, uh, couple of decades. And more recently, I've been looking at autonomy in the broader context of robotic exploration, where a robot is not necessarily a rover. Um, it could be any type of spacecraft. And one of the things I want to share here with uh, the audience is taking a broader look at autonomy and what drives the need for autonomy, why I would make the argument that in the future we're going to have an, a large increase in autonomy. If we look at our past missions, as represented by the first circle, we had a lot of spacecrafts that actually flew by or orbited other bodies. In the, recent, in the present, we've seen a number of rovers, number of delivery platforms for these rovers, as you see here with the Sky Crane and the Curiosity rover. And we're going to see very soon, perhaps in, in, in a month or so, another form 
of Explorer, which is a Mars helicopter, which we heard uh, talked about in the previous um, uh, panel. And so looking at the past, present, and future, one of the things we noticed is that the forms of explorers is becoming more and more diverse from these spacecrafts to more uh, sophisticated type of explorers, whether it's a rover or it's a flying platform, it's a highly articulated system. Another thing that happens and over that period of time is sensing has substantially improved in terms of the richness and the availability of visual and 3D sensors, as well as the situational awareness that the system has to do understanding the traversability, recognizing objects and so forth. The other important aspect is that the, um, in the past, um, a lot of the exploration really relied on understanding the orbital dynamics where models were good and mature. In the future, when you're get on planetary surfaces, as anybody who has done, as we heard from JAXA and as well as, well as uh, you know, from NASA, the interaction with an unknown surface is always very challenging and there's always a surprise and you can name all the missions, whether they're rover or landers or uh, small body missions, there's always an element of surprise with what we encounter. Another thing is that we have to contend with a larger number of uncertainties, especially when we operate either on the surface or into these planetary bodies. So that's why I would argue that in the future, we're going to need a substantial amount of autonomy. In the past, we were able to rely on higher predictability. In the future, what's really critical is to have the flexibility, the flexibility to understand the situation at hand and the flexibility to be able to act on that situation. And the reason is resources will remain limited uh, in terms of available power, thermal challenges, communication pipelines. And so how do we deal with that, these challenges that are anticipated in the future? Now, autonomy, just very briefly, I'll touch upon this clearly important for exploration, getting us places where we can go without autonomy. It also factors into productivity. We can run the same mission, but it will take a lot longer to achieve the science. And with autonomy, you can be more productive. Eventually, once matured, autonomy will increase the robustness of the spacecraft and its operation. And also, it could also impact costs in terms of operational cost uh, by changing the tempo and the interaction with the ground. Um, now, one of the key challenges is really bringing all the elements of autonomy, all the elements, uh, the domains together into a system as a whole. And this is just a very um, high level view of the situational, uh, situation and self-awareness that you have to have, which includes a lot of estimation that has elements in perception, model building, hazard assessment, but also a lot of the reasoning and acting. And of course, Cutting across all this is how can a system, an explorer, learn from its own experience? Or how can a system or explorer learn from other explorers' experience? And how do multiple assets coordinate, which cuts across uh, it's, you know, all the autonomy disciplines of a single asset that has to explore autonomously? So one of the things is, is always good to go is look back, far back. I was, I'm always very interested because when you go back decades, sometimes you see concepts that were explored back then and then never moved forward and 10, 20 years later, uh, get, they get picked up again. And two examples I love to mention is a helicopter. The helicopter actually was explored a decade ago and it always took a decade uh, of being dormant to, to come back again. And the other one was um, some of the, um, you know, form of mobility, the two-wheeled mobility actually is a concept that was explored back in the 70s in a non-tethered form and we've seen a resurgence of that in the last couple of decades. This just shows a breadth of the possibilities of surface explorers from different type of articulated systems to wheels on legs and so forth. And, and then more recent, these are concepts for lunar exploration. One of them is, was done for a study, the one on the right here, which was the Intrepid rover, which uh, was for a mission study for the upcoming, uh, the ongoing uh, decade of survey. And, it's interesting when you look and investigate the autonomy needs of such systems, especially coming up in the future, one thing uh, to remember is that while people may think the moon is very close by um, and you had a, a less need for autonomy, if you look at extended missions, missions that will take multiple years and availability of the communication infrastructure and the bandwidths, then that formula does change uh, when you compare a short duration missions versus a long duration mission. And that was the case uh, with this intrepid rover that we worked with Terry and others uh, on the team. This was led by Arizona State University. 
very exciting in the next month we're gonna you know see the landing of the uh, perseverance rover and the ingenuity helicopter and two things i would like to mention is that there are two um, novel aspects of autonomy on this mission one associated with landing on mars and that is looking at the terrain itself and being able to esti estimate uh, the parameters during landing based on features on the terrain uh, using terrain relative navigation and the other element is a more sophisticated navigation of the rover itself now what differs from this rover with its predecessor it's going to be it, ha it is endowed with a, a capability of um, fpga computing so it will be able to process both the stereoscopic imagery and the visual odometry at a much faster rate being able to do so that enables is now open up a possibility to do something we call thinking while driving, which is something we have not done in our prior rovers where the rover acquired the imagery, stopped, made the decisions and took a step. In this case, because of the faster computing enabled by the FPGA, we'll be able to do thinking while driving. Um, there are um, other aspects of the navigation that's more sophisticated, which is in the way the terrain gets assessed. It's, it'll, be, it'll be able to actually look at the footprint of the rover in a less conservative fashion than previous rovers and be able to negotiate more challenging terrain. Now, the other thing which uh, Tim uh, alluded to is a lot of the interesting stuff is actually happening in the non-flat regions, especially when you look at the moon and Mars. On, on Mars, we have areas where we've seen ice scarps. We've seen the interior of crater walls where there's some phenomena of recurring slope linea. These are what uh, appear to be like uh, seasonal seeps. Um, there are exposed stratigraphy that we see that could tell us about the history of the moon and Mars. All these interesting sites are in terrains that are currently inaccessible to state-of-the-art rovers. Um, and people have been thinking about this on the research side and as well on the development side. So you can see here, a range of rovers, a couple of them from Carnegie Mellon, um, from uh, JPL, from University of Toronto, from um, Tim's lab. And people have come up with different ideas, whether they're legged or wheeled or hybrids or some articulated systems. Um, sorry about that. Okay, sorry about that. So this is a concept um, of a two-wheeled rover system it's actually a four-wheel system that repels down these steep slopes. And one of the key elements of this is to be able to also acquire measurements on these steep slopes with multiple instruments. So this is just a very a small uh, video clip of the rover called Duaxel rover and repels down these two-wheeled axle rovers that can go over some fairly challenging terrain. It, has, it carries its onboard sensors. And the key aspect of this, it's actually powering and communicating through that tether that we see here. And um, so let me play another video here, maybe without, okay. Okay, so actually one of the key aspects, and I fully agree with Tim, we, where, where we are with these extreme terrain rovers is where we were with the traditional rovers about a decade or two ago. And we are just at the beginning uh, of trying to understand what does it mean to navigate something with tethers, and especially when you're trying to go into extended um, areas where you could be rappelling down hundreds of meters, if not kilometers. There's definitely new challenges associated with this. But one of the key aspects of using a tether, as I mentioned earlier, is you get power, you get communication, but also critically, you get mechanical support. Um, the terrains that you encounter on these more extreme environments are less known. They could be high sinkage terrains, you, you, you have a, a risk of getting entrapped, and the tether winches you out like you would have with your car um, if you get stuck. So this is an example of a four-wheeled rover that can uh, repel a two-wheeled element, and, uh, and it goes down over the steep terrains. And again, similar fashion that you saw earlier, it's carrying all these instruments inside these wheel wells and be able to orient them to take multiple measurements. So what you look here is about 30 degree slopes and you're, um, you're coming there and then deploying, you point your instruments on the targets you wanna access and then you deploy uh, the instrument. This is in this case is a near infrared spectrometer. Go down to the surface and you take measurements. Of course, you can also do subsurface measurements where you can deploy a probe into the ground and be able to acquire measurements. 
Now, the reason I bring all this up, these are very different forms of mobility than the ones that we've seen on Mars and on the moon. Um, what enables these rovers is a new type of uh, algorithms and autonomy that would become critical if you were to cover tens of meters, hundreds of meters on these very rough terrains. You have to have some level of situational awareness. Now, what you see here in this, uh, this clip is the situation awareness that the rover is building through its onboard sensors, assessing what terrain is traversable. Interesting about these extreme terrain rovers, the whole notion of traversability and hazard changes because now you are attached to a tether. So going over an edge that is a, is a, a, a sharp drop is not necessarily a hazard here because you are hanging on the tether. Uh, what would be a hazard is a situation where you can get between two rocks that could wedge your wheels. That would be a hazard. So it forces us to rethink the whole notion of navigation and motion planning. And another important aspect of this is now you're, you're, you're hanging on a tether and you have to plan your routes in a way um, that you don't want to get the tether entangled. So there's a lot of ongoing research in the area of understanding the homotopic classes for tethered navigation, understanding what anchors you create, how do you de-anchor, um, how do you manage your, uh, your tether for these extended distances? Of course, after you do your excursion, you come back, you redock with your system, and you go and explore the next site. So, as I mentioned here, and I'm wrapping up. Um, oh. Another element based oh, on sorry, the. Sorry, that's. that's get okay. So, key to this um, is the whole idea of understanding what it means to do tether navigation autonomously on a planetary body, which introduces yet another form of autonomy that we need to contend with, which is tethered navigation. A lot of this work, actually, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have two of uh, Tim's uh, top-notch students working with us at JPL, and they can bring in a lot of the expertise and a lot of the work they've done uh, with Tim um, to, J to JPL and NASA and, um, and further advancing this field. And we looked at these in the context of navigating down Shackleton Crater. We looked at these in navigating down some of the Martian craters. And by no means, these are easy terrains to negotiate. But I think if we want to go after interesting sites in the future, um, we have to be thinking and developing these technologies. And, and one of the things just to mention is when we think about access and mobility and autonomy, the access through the surface is one, but let's not forget that there's other concepts to access different locations through other means than rolling on the surface. And these could be include hopping, as we heard Takashi mentioned, also could include, um, you know, hopping on Mars as some, you know, work that was done at MIT and Draper, as well as other places. So there's different ways of thinking of access in an autonomous fashion that could involve wheels or legs or none of the above. Okay. And I think I'm just going to stop here and uh, pass it back to Terry. Great. <clears throat> thanks very much, Isa, and, and, and thanks uh, to Tim and uh, Takashi. Um, Isa did a great job of actually, I think, um, opening up a whole topic that we want to start getting into now when we start uh, having some discussion here, which is really the, the motivations for increasing autonomy, um, especially with planetary surface missions, or at least missions that involve mobility. Um, and, one of the things that, that, I, that I heard you say, he says that, uh, that autonomy is really motivated by our interest of trying to, to go to places which are more difficult and therefore may require different kinds of architectures than we've, we've used to date. Um, so rather than just a single planetary wheeled rover, maybe looking at ones that could be split and as a sort of hybrid concepts, or maybe ones that involve multiple robots, including ones that are flying or something. I'm curious. Uh, Tim, what do you think about that? Do you agree, or do you think that Issa is like completely wrong? Well, I obviously don't think he's wrong because we started copying some of his cool ideas and experimenting with them uh, in a few projects ourselves. Um, but I, I guess I would turn the question around since we're mostly talking about you know autonomy and and how that might connect to this. Is I guess I've thought about the following thing. For wheeled robots that are kind of driving around, you know, the kind of rovers that we're used to now, I would argue that our autonomy still has not caught up with the mechanical capabilities of those robots. And then based on the videos that ESA was just showing, you know, as we start to access more and more complex terrains with these mechanically more complicated rovers, are we setting ourselves up for failure by, by making the autonomy 
problem even harder. Like, if we can't catch up to the mechanical capabilities of simple rovers, how will we catch up to those of really complex rovers? So you're saying you're saying that we we still are not yet fully um, achieving everything that can be done, even with just uh, say four or six wheeled uh, vehicles and their associated suspension. So if we yeah, that, that's my hypothesis. Interesting. You know, the rocker we're not driving at the full we're not driving autonomously at the full capability of the rocker bogey chassis. You know, Tim, you're absolutely right, and actually, that's a, you raise a very important point. And I think one of the things that we want to do is be looking at the entire spectrum, including things that are even simpler than the rocker bogey, all the way to more sophisticated <laughs> things. And the great thing, I think our robotics community and the autonomy community are large communities, and there's a lot of problems to tackle. And I agree, I think with autonomy, um, it'd be good to take a look at also some of the simpler forms and, and, and fully realize their capacity. I mean, even, even with the rocker bogeys, even with the rovers, if you consider all the possible things that could happen that result from the interaction of the rover with the terrain, whether it's through mobility or through manipulation, there's always surprises. How do you establish that situational awareness, let alone control the platform to get you out of those situations that you can get stuck in? And there's a lot of room there. Um, I think one of the things that held us back is the computational capability, but that's starting to change and it could rapidly change. So if computation continues to go at a, at a good pace and we continue to adopt this thing, we need to be ready. And, and I think there's a lot of room to advance things, but also there has to be a willingness to advance it. So I, I'm curious there, um, you know, if we're, if we're saying that, that maybe one of the things we should be looking at is, is how we can even get, you know, more you know, autonomy or more independence with even simple mechanisms, I, you know, I look at some of the work that you have talked about Takashi, um, where you're just looking at, frankly, um, basically hopping type mobility. I mean, you're, you're not roving over thing. You're basically managing point contacts. What are your thoughts about, you know, is, is that something that still needs a lot more development? Um, do you feel that the autonomy is absolutely essential uh, for those kinds of systems? Or have we already figured everything out? <laughs> well, okay. So the, I told that the, the autonomy is important for deep space missions because of the, where well, the uh, communication delay, orbit rate, or limited to sensors, and then the, of course, the unknown uh, exploration area. So, so that's why the uh, autonomy is required for safe and efficient exploration. And also, from the viewpoint of the cost, maybe operation cost or something. That's why the, so the robotics group are honestly studying and developing the autonomy, but the scientists maybe do, do not believe the autonomy is good or not. Hmm. Yeah, I think, but, but the autonomy is, is important, I believe. <laughs> So we've talked a bit about, we've talked a bit about, I think, motivations or the need for autonomy, but, um, you know, mm -hmm. if we start looking into where we should go from here, there, there are different ways to think about increasing the, the level of autonomy, because autonomy, of course, could just be focused on decision making where you're trying to choose between, uh, you know, what you might do from planning, or maybe you're going to change this to somehow to have a tighter integration between perception and planning. But there's a whole different aspect, which is uh, I think a lot of people are focused on today, and that's the role of learning and adaptation um, to make the systems uh, you know, be more appropriate, at least in terms of their the real-time behavior to the environment or the situation. Uh, what do you all think about um, you know, pushing to, to have increased levels of, of learning, especially you know, onboard real-time, whether that is with significant data or one-shot learning? Um, because of course that comes at the risk of, well, Maybe it'll, it'll learn the wrong thing. Um, Tim, you've done you know, a lot of work on, on you know, adaptive systems and especially ones that have you know, increasingly made use of, of learning, whether that's uh, non-real-time or real-time. What are your thoughts about that for space missions? Yeah, I think space is one of the most challenging places to deploy learning algorithms just, just because of the safety issue, right? Safe learning is, is obviously a hot topic in, in research today, but from my experience trying to you know, build a system that's able to learn while guaranteeing its own safety is, is, is really challenging. You know, I think, I think there's a few places you could use learning. On the mission is one place, but before the mission is another place, right? So we could easily start to build out 
techniques that are better at terrain assessment by just practicing lots on the earth rather than trying to a priori model things, for example. So, you know, one, one option for space is you do the learning before you go and then you kind of certify the, the result uh, that you're happy with it and then deploy it. Trying to do it on site, I think is, it's a good idea, but how do you, how do you guarantee the mission stays safe? That, I don't have the answer for that. You know, I want to, I want to learn to drive up and down with a tether and then the first thing I try, I get stuck in the game, now, game over, right? Yeah, I, I was, I, I'd actually like to turn that question over to Isa because um, I imagine that you could answer that with, with, you know, two different perspectives. One is the perspective from, you know, uh, you know, sort of flagship class planetary rover missions where the idea of, you know, taking on more risk is, is the absolute sort of like a non-starter um, for everything from design development operations versus a lot of the research um, and, plan and in analog testing that you've done with things like, like dual axle where, well, risk is just, you know, part of what you're doing. And so maybe learning is just yet another risk. What are your thoughts about that? Is, is there a place for, for learning, especially in, in flagship planetary rover missions? I think there is, um, I would say there is a place for learning. And I think there's multiple things. One thing, if we look at learning, one of the unique aspects of space is that we are not going to have the training sets to train the algorithms. Now, perhaps we'll do better on Mars, but even in places like the Mars and the Moon, um, you go to different regions, there's also differences in what we encounter. Now, one thing we, we also shouldn't forget is we have relied on physics all along, and physics hasn't failed us yet in when we interact physically in other worlds. Now, what makes it super difficult is we don't know the environment. We can predict, the scientists can predict what the bounds on you know, these thermal mechanical properties are. We can try to predict how the system will interact. And despite our prediction, our best knowledge as humans, sometimes the uncertainties are outside the bounds of what we have accounted for. And that happened, I mean, many examples. So then the question is, you know, how can we rely on learning? How can we use learning? Well, learning is, is, has showed remarkable progress in dealing with uncertainties. And if we can combine learning with physics in the most capable way, I think we can benefit from using learning where our models are not expressive or accurate enough to represent something but combine them with ways where we understand the physics at the right level of the problem. And that combination of the two perhaps can allow us to build systems that are reliable and capable. The other thing I wanna mention is we shouldn't also forget that when we go and explore deep in space, resources are limited and sometimes we have a ticking time. You take Europa as an example, you go into Europa and then if you're on the surface and you're operating with primary batteries, you have a ticking clock and in action, is, 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 is also risk. Um, and so that's where, where, when do you take action and when do you wait? And so there's all kind of challenging problems to contend with. I would argue, I think we, are, we ought to use all possible advances in terrestrial applications, but apply them in the correct way to deal with them in a space environment in a safe manner. And I wouldn't advocate, I would advocate learning how to walk before we can run. So there's a lot of room to do things uh, with simpler systems, simpler platforms, um, a lot of small set opportunities, and then figure that out and learn how to do autonomy with physics, with machine learning, with everything, and then you can do it in more flagship missions. So Isa, you, you said two interesting things there. Um, one, you talked about the fact that in uh, these deep space missions, you know, planetary missions or, or small body missions that you know, clearly you have lots of constraints. Uh, there are constraints due to the environment, there are constraints just because of, frankly, the physics of what we can actually put into space uh, in terms of computation, power, et cetera, like that. And at the same time, you talked about, you know, trying to take advantage of a lot of the things that we're doing, you know, here on Earth and then applying. Um, question for you all here, um, what are your thoughts about trying to reduce or maybe sort of bridge the gap that we see between all the great work terrestrially and the things done in space? I mean, I see the work, for example, that Tim, that you've done over the years, and you know, it went from you know, planetary rovers, which are frankly even analog rovers that are somewhat constrained to self-driving cars. But of course, it's not a fair comparison because a lot of the cars you see out there that are being used for autonomous work have far more computation and power and sensors that we could even conceive of for space. Any thoughts about that, about how to sort of reduce that gap? Or is it just ever increasing? Are we just gonna, 
be even more and more trailing behind what's the state of the art in autonomous vehicles on Earth um, versus what's in space. Tim, mm -hmm. your thoughts? I mean, the data would point to the latter, right? So I, I started working on ExoMars in like 2003. And, you know, visual odometry was kind of a new and interesting thing around that time, right? It hadn't, hadn't been deployed live on, on rovers yet. And, and, you know, flash forward to 2020 and like perseverance is going to be amazing, but like the big innovation on that side is we can run visual odometry faster. Right, it's it's we're not actually deploying anywhere near what what the you know capabilities of various algorithms are in in the research side, like the types of things that we run on self driving. It, it, you know, it's a power and compute issue, right? If you had more power and more compute, you could start to run more of these things. I think the like to acknowledge it, I think the gap between research and autonomy and what's been deployed is getting bigger. I think it's an expanding universe. So, you know, especially for academics, it. Personally, I had to move away from working on space just because, you know, publishing a faster visual odometry algorithm isn't really a paper anymore for me. So, like, having to, like, take on these more terrestrial applications just because we have access to faster computers and power means that we can, we can try out more cutting-edge ideas on real systems. So, I'd, I'd like to find my way back into space, but I, I don't know how to do it. I, I do want to jump in here. So, I... I agree with you, Tim. I think that the gap is getting bigger, but I want to make two points. Just one point, in all fairness, to the you know people working the twenty twenty rover. Actually, the innovation it, it is it, you know the, the faster is one aspect of it, but of course the more sophisticated algorithm to be able to negotiate rougher terrain. That's another. That's a major advance that we will see in the in the Perseverance rover that we have on. Um, and there's also the advances on the helicopter. But the point is 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 still valid that because even with the computation that we're putting, uh, there's still, you know, an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude from where terrestrial application is. Now, one thing we will always be constrained by is power. Uh, power, getting greater power, especially as you go farther in space, is very, very challenging. And that's fundamental. The thermal environment is so fundamental to the places we go. So thermal and power will always dominate. The question is, what can we do? How can we bridge the gap? Now, it is true that that gap is only in the recent um, you know, times, in the last couple of decades. If you go back, there was a time where things that were done for space were the most advanced. Um, and so that doesn't mean that the current state of things have to remain. Uh, and so, um, so I think um, we ought to be willing to take bold, innovative steps, we'll almost leapfrog. Um, now, of course, the radiation, the thermal environment, this fundamental aspects of space makes it very, very challenging. But I believe that there's a lot of innovation to be done in multiple areas that could potentially uh, leapfrog or close the gap. But we have to be thinking radically differently. And that's another research in another area. That's actually a really interesting point you just raised there, Issa. The, the fact that we used to think, oh, space is, uh, you know, where you have these really great inventions, you know, maybe not Velcro, but, you know, certainly the, the fact that we used to look at space as the, the thing that really pushes the cutting edge. And now I think that a lot of people who work um, at, at space agencies are just looking like, oh boy, how can we even catch up to what's being done on Earth? Um, in any case, we just have a few minutes left here. I do want to take some questions from the audience. Um, there's one question that's actually kind of related to this last topic we talked about of the, the increasing gap between you know, the state of the art on Earth and in space. And that has to do with the, this question that was posed of, you know, what is the level of standardization, uh, software and hardware, uh, to build autonomous rovers that might help reduce costs and allow structure improvements? And I would contend maybe help close the gap. Um, I did mention, for example, that uh, that Viper is making use of ROS2 in, in some limited way. It's only being used on the ground, not on board. Uh, but I know that within NASA, there are a number of projects that are looking at how you can actually qualify um, at least parts of ROS2 so it can be used in space. And uh, I should say that, you know, ROS is actually used uh, on robots in the, you know, that have been inside the space station, but not in a planetary mission yet. Thoughts about, you know, how standards might actually improve um, and maybe close the gap between what we see on Earth and space. Um, Takashi, what do you think from a, a Japanese point of view? Yes, so the, to reduce the gaps, the JAXA is trying to apply the ground technology to space missions. 
So JAXA uh, uh, so they created a new center for innovation in space and on Earth. And then the, so JAXA is trying to gather the knowledge and the specialists from various fields, including industries and academia, and then create a new research teams for developing the technology for future on a Mars question. So ground-based technologies are so also effective, but we have to pay attention to the uh, specification or specific of space, of course. Thank you. So along the lines of that one, um, another question from the audience is, you know, how uh, are realistic physics simulation systems, um, like the, used, the, one, the ones used for autonomous vehicles, changing the way you develop rovers? So maybe to get at your point, Takashi, that um, because space has a lot of unique features that, uh, that are perhaps difficult to, to replicate on Earth, uh, at least in terms of analogs or laboratories, we have to rely on, on simulation. What do you think about that? Is that an important part of your work? Yeah, so it is so difficult to test all the functions by imitating planetary environment on the Earth, on the ground. So, so that's why the uh, test and the uh, verification and the validation of autonomy is important. So maybe field tests are effective and also the uh, hardware or software simulation is also developed and useful, but uh, it's not perfect. Yeah. That's why we have to uh, demonstrate uh, in space. Okay. Uh, Isa, <laughs> I know that you've spent a lot of time recently thinking about uh, uh, simulation systems uh, or maybe test beds in general um, and the role that they play for getting at uh, more autonomous functions. You know, what do you think some of the biggest challenges are? Is it really um, you know, crafting something that can be used by lots of people? Is it representing things in high fidelity? Is it something else? What's really yeah. hard about using these, these simulation uh, systems and test beds, uh, especially for testing more autonomous functions? Well, there are two things. The first thing I would say is that unfortunately, neither simulations nor real systems are in themselves adequate. It's always a combination of the two. And the reason is because in simulation, there's still a lot of struggle in modeling the interaction, the physical interaction of assets, whether they're manipulators or mobile systems or hoppers and the environment. Um, and in the, in, in the real world is getting the statistical, uh, you know, assessment of performance is extremely difficult and costly. Now you combine the two and you hope to have that system cover both aspects. So you need both. Um, now, one thing I would say also is that um, certain things that will become very notoriously difficult, like microgravity and Takashi can attest to that, doing any mobility experimentation, you know, even parabolic flights or dropping things through towers and so forth, very limited amount of time. Um, now, one of the key challenges for the community at large is getting the community access to these simulations or these platforms. And you and I know when we were developing the rover program, it was very difficult to have rovers at low cost available back two decades ago. Now there's a little bit more avail available things. And I think we, sh we should be thinking as if there are simulations that are matured enough and that could become accessible, then maybe it could accelerate research that could actually be very applicable and relevant to NASA and JAXA and maybe other space agencies. So I want to go a little bit beyond that, uh, beyond just, of course, the space agencies, which, of course, you know, do typically build uh, simulations and test beds for their missions into this larger question of, of how this can reach out to broader communities. So you know, I turn to you, Tim, um, as uh, you know, the, the resident academic on this, on this panel here. Um, what are your thoughts about um, the use of simulators and, and test beds, especially if they come from a space agency? Is that something you feel is helpful or do you think that the space agencies just don't quite know how to then match those up to the needs of, of those working in, in academia? Uh, good questions. Uh, I, I, might, I might answer a different question first before I answer your question. Okay. Um, <laughs> which is, I, I'm not a, I haven't been a huge user of simulation in the past because I've done a lot of work with, with vision and cameras and I haven't, you know, there have been not that many sort of photo real, photorealistic simulators for outdoor environments uh, until somewhat recently that have been you know, good enough. And it, it's been pretty easy to just put cameras on things to get real data. So we've generally done that. That being said, during this pandemic year, I made use of simulations a lot more than, uh, than before, just because our access to the labs is, is significantly less. So certain things are easier to simulate than others, I think, in robotics. You know, lasers are easier to simulate than cameras. Um, 
you know, Issa made the point about, you know, physics was good for things that were in orbit, but, you know, physics gets more complicated to model and, and put into a simulator when you've got wheels interacting with loose soil, right? And so, you know, even from the time of Becker until today, our, our knowledge of exactly how to model wheels, different types of wheels interacting with loose soil is, is an uh, ongoing effort, I think. You know, there's people putting wheels into parabolic flights in single wheel test beds to try to better understand how the wheel will actually interact with soil that itself is not under Earth's gravity, but in reduced gravity environment. So it's, it's an open problem for, for certain types of things. So I think simulations are good for some things. Real testing is good for other things, just like Isa said. Um, would simulators coming from space agencies uh, be welcomed in the academic community? I, I would think so. I mean, uh, you know, the gazebo environment in, in robotics at large has been a huge enabler for different groups to be able to get into, into robotics that maybe couldn't afford to, to have, you know, a multi-robot test bed of their own. I think, I think that's been a, a big game changer. Standardized software answering the earlier question, I think, um, has been a big enabler of more advanced autonomy systems in terrestrial applications. Um, but uh, for space, I'm not sure. Great. Well, um, I would love to keep talking with all of you for the next 24 hours or maybe next uh, 24 years, but uh, unfortunately we're out of time. I, I do want to thank you very much, uh, you know, Tim, Isa, Takashi for, you know, joining us today and across time zones across the world. And uh, with that, we'll turn it back to you, Mark, for the rest of uh, the, uh, the autonomy workshop. And thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Thanks well, very thanks, much. Uh, Harry, thanks to Kashi, Lisa, and team. That was a great discussion. Uh, I, I certainly learned a lot. Um, that's partly because I know nothing about rovers until now. Um, but uh, this is really exciting, the, the types of uh, uh, rovers that are out there. I didn't know there was such a diversity of rovers. And it's interesting to see the in the most recent uh, response, the sort of maybe the improvement in the physical simulations is starting to uh, play a role in how you develop them now. So that's great. Um, we are actually going to transition to a Q&A slash uh, coffee break uh, for the next hour. So, so if there are questions from the audience uh, here live, uh, some of them were actually posted uh, here in the chat, Terry. I, I don't know whether we, we would like to cover those um, before we sort of go on a break and just let everybody loose. Sure, I, I, I guess if there are additional questions that we can take now, if uh, the, the three other uh, rover panelists uh, can stay around for at least a few more minutes, maybe we can get to those. Um, uh, like I said, I, I'm not quite sure where all the, well, I guess Tim is probably the, the latest uh, time zone because it's like evening for you almost. Uh, so let's see here. Um, there was a question here. What are your views on using biomimetics in rovers? Anybody want to take that? I would argue we already we already do that. We we make somewhat anthropomorphized creatures that that crawl around. But the the one thing I wanted to add to that was this tumbleweed rover idea that's been around for a long time. I, you know, going back to the earlier discussion about maybe simpler mechanisms could be an interesting thing to explore. There was this idea of like basically a beach ball that would get blown around by Martian winds. And I've always liked that idea. I've, I've, I would like to see that fly at some point. Uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that potentially you could deploy many of these things and if some of them got stuck in, in, in a ditch, it would be okay because others might, you know, travel a long way and get lots of interesting data. So I like that idea. If I may, I think, you know, the innovation in the type of mobility platform will continue and it's an extremely important innovation because different destinations will drive different designs. And unfortunately, there won't be one solution that fits all because the environments are very different. So I think we're going to see that. And I, you know, we've seen some new ideas like the helicopter come to take form. Hopefully, maybe that tumbleweed idea, maybe someday will take form or some other ones um, that may take form to different destinations. I think you could probably argue that uh, a hopper at, uh, at, at certain rates looks very much like a tumbleweed, just depending on how fast it pops and, and, yeah. and how much under control it actually is. Yeah. Um, no, there's another question, and I'm not really sure how to interpret this because I think you could go multiple ways, um, is what are some of the most relevant terrestrial applications and companies 
that will benefit mobility in space, um, such as robotic agriculture. So I don't know, does that mean um, things from Earth that could improve or change the way we think about mobility in space or vice versa? Um, answer it any way you'd like. Tim? I mean, we, I guess we all know that there are certain sort of core building blocks of autonomy, these localization, mapping, planning, control things that I, that I think cut across applications. So of course, developing them for, for some terrestrial applications will help us inform ideas for, for future space missions. Um, that, that's the thing that comes to mind. Um, I would argue that maybe some of the off, for rovers specifically, some of the off-road applications like agriculture or mining um, might tell us more than self-driving cars where we rely pretty heavily on like specific infrastructure in the environment or, or sort of struck, not infrastructure, but there's a structure to the problem. I think the space problem is more inherently unstructured. And so, you know, agriculture or mining might be, might be more relevant there. Okay, um, another question here uh, that was actually in the Zoom chat. Um, with regards to risk of new technologies, um, do you have an idea of what the threshold is for adoption in space uh, so that the perceived residual risk becomes acceptable? For example, for, uh, for instance, FPGAs were mentioned a few times. So it's really a question of adopting new technology in space and, and how do we, um, is there a threshold for that? Um, I will say that uh, you know, within NASA, adoption of technology um, in a broad sense has always been a, a big challenge because missions that are, have a very, very uh, you know, conservative risk posture. Uh, they generally don't want to use new technology unless it's absolutely needed. That is, that the technology will, is the only way, the new technology is the only way to actually accomplish what the mission requires. And I think that that has been a real barrier because that means that, well, if something worked before, we'll just keep using it again, seems to be a, a pretty standard mission design paradigm. Um, I think that one of the things also that, um, that NASA has been trying to do is uh, trying to find ways to um, show people that, okay, we can take new risks, we can adopt new technologies, and that's why we're starting to see, or I shouldn't have said just starting, but we have seen um, the increasing use of these technology demonstrations. Um, I mean, you could actually argue that the reason we have rovers today um, is because of Sojourner, which was a tech demo that was added onto, Sojour onto the Pathfinder mission. You could argue that Mars helicopter is a technology demonstration that might open up the world, uh, so to speak, uh, to, uh, to flying robots for other planets. But uh, I guess I'm interested in, on the, on the Japanese side, uh, at least in JAXA, you know, uh, Takashi, is there some sort of threshold for new technology? <laughs> yeah, so the, of course the uh, new technology has uh, some risks, yeah. But the, so the, so where the, so, we, we don't use the better technology. We develop, we have to develop a required technology. Then required technology has a, a new, new, new methods or new elements. Then we have to try to develop new technology with some risks. That's why we have to test and test uh, to reduce the risk. Mark, it looks like there's a, a question here for, um, for a different panel. Do you want to just take over the q and I, I think we've gotten through most of the ones for the rover panel. I want to thank uh, Terry and the panelists again for this very stimulating uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, so uh, that uh, concludes the my panel discussion about autonomous rovers. Uh, we will reconvene for the next talks by uh, Salah and Animesh and Srija and Gabriel uh, at basically in 50 minutes time. So um, right now, feel free to, to stay on and hang around or grab something to eat. Uh, I will read out the question from Cedric in case any of our attendees or panelists want to answer, then that is, and are there any concrete plans for use of swarm robotics in space? Is that not a great solution to manage risk, e.g. redundancy, cost savings, duplicating same robots? So anybody who is interested in answering that question. I, I'm happy to take a stab at this. Um, 
definitely the whole idea of swarm and um, has been in discussion, has been in the research for space applications for some time. One of the key challenges is, is that each entity would have to duplicate all the different, uh, so all the solutions to all the diff disciplines in terms you have to have a solution for calm, for thermal, for power. So you end up with a lot of redundancy in terms of having to build that in every spacecraft. If you're given a total mass, the question is, how do you allocate that mass in, in terms of duplicating a lot of the basic functions versus having more capable, fewer entities? So that's always been the difficulty, but it doesn't mean, I think, as, as the computing and as the needs for the instrumentation, the payloads is getting smaller and reduced, it opens up the possibility of more swarm type because you can afford you can design the system to afford losing some um but that, that's always been the big challenge is the resources thank you would anyone else like to comment well if not uh, thanks again i will just uh flash up a screen that says that we're on a break until uh the top of the next hour uh and uh, we, we can't really clap loud clap. <laughs> Can you thank, thank you so much for your contributions. Yeah. See you all later. Thank you. Mm -hmm.